There's a battle brewing between the airlines and the travel apps. Password security questions are useless. And we found a drone that folds up to fit in your pocket. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 343 for Thursday, May 21st, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all of the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney, and joining me today is travel, fitness, and organizational tech expert, Jill Duffy. Jill is the author of Get Organized, How to Clean Up Your Messy Digital Life, The Get Organized Guide to Travel, and she's a contributing editor at PC Magazine. Welcome, Jill. Hi, Megan. How are you? Thanks for coming back. I am doing well. So there's a story in the Wall Street Journal yesterday about a group of travel websites who say that Delta Airlines has cut off access to their flight information. The group includes TripAdvisor, Hitmonk, Cheapo Air, and a few others. Now, you have some experiences with the way these travel aggregation sites work. Is this kind of control by the airline new? Well, it's not totally new. There's been a couple of airlines over the years who have opted out of this sort of thing. Um, Southwest was the big one in the U.S. for a long time. So people are probably familiar with travel aggregation sites, things like Orbitz and Expedia and TripAdvisor, that let you search a number of different airlines at once to get the best price. Um, they're, they're wonderful for consumers. They help us comparison shop. They often have really great filters to drill down how many stops we're going to have on a journey, what times we're going to leave. Uh, but the airline Airlines are really feeling the pinch lately with prices. So they don't want to have only their budget seats sold. They want to be able to sell customers at a higher price and they want to be able to upsell them with things like, you know, economy plus, extra leg room, um, priority boarding, things like that. And if you buy a ticket on these other sites, you're often not paying for those upsells. So that's the real reason a lot of these airlines are feeling the burden. Right. It's those things where if you actually book at the airline, like it's, you know, click through and do I want to pay 25 more dollars and do I want to pay, you know, 35 more dollars. And so they're missing all that. Someone's going to another airline to get their cheap sites. I can see how right, they can be right. frustrated with that. Um, but a new report by the Travel Technology Association you know, says this is really bad for the consumer, obviously. Uh, it, they can pay more than $30 more average per ticket um, by booking through the airlines, $120 for a family of four making a trip. I think if you include all those upgrades, it's probably a lot more. Uh, so are, they, are airlines losing, I mean, are they losing face by doing this? Are they, are they losing customers? Like, why is Delta the only one? Isn't it bad for them at this point? Well, Delta is not exactly the only one. There are a couple of other airlines, like I said, Southwest, who's kind of opted out before. American Airlines has been touch and go with some of the sites. What's weird about this latest thing with Delta is some of the sites that they don't want to participate in actually send the user to Delta Airlines. So the user does the comparison part on the site like TripAdvisor. And then instead of booking the ticket right there, they get sent to Delta. Uh, Google Flights works similarly. So you get all of the information in front of you and then you get sent to Delta. So that's that's the part that's really weird about this latest one is what is Delta's real motives behind it? I think they're probably just foreseeing something more in the future that they want to be careful. They want to keep their customers on their site. They want to keep people in their network. Um, again, make the upsell. And it's, it's going to be harder, harder to do that the more travel aggregation sites we have out there. Now, what's interesting about travel aggregation sites is a lot of the information is public. I don't think the prices are. I think the prices are the point at which the airlines can either decide to, to be a part of it or not. Um, but airlines all share their information with one another. This goes back to the early 80s. There's a company that nobody really talks about called Sabre. And they are the system behind managing all of the flight times, all of the dates of travel, things like that. Um, and airlines agreed way back when to share this information with one another. And this was because of things like, you know, organizing an airport and uh, rebooking a passenger on another airline. If your airline had a major disaster, you know, a, a hurricane somewhere that took a lot of your fleet out of commission. Um, so when you see things like uh, the ability to look up when a flight is expected to land on Google 
or the ability to get real-time information about flight details from TripIt or TripCase. That information is is controlled by this other open platform that anybody can use. So I think it's really just the price stuff that the, that the companies are starting to become really sensitive about. Right, that makes sense. So now this report said that the, the airlines would continue to partner with a limited but responsive and adaptable group of online retailers. How? What do they want from these? I mean, what's adaptable mean when it comes to these aggregation sites? Well, I, I think what's really happening is that the market is getting more competitive. And when markets are competitive, prices go down for consumers. That's good for us. That's bad for the airline industry. Um, I, I don't know exactly what they mean by adaptive, but they probably want to work with partners who are not going to give away their rock bottom seats all the time. And again, if we have a lot of tools to make those assessments, we're going to figure out which ones are going to give us the best price. Now, if you think about the travel industry in general, hotels are where these tra travel aggregation sites actually make their money. You have a number of rooms in a hotel. That's not going to change. They need to sell the room. They have more flexible prices. When it comes to airlines, if they don't sell enough seats on a plane, they just don't run that flight. So if you can start to see why, of course, if you have all these bargain basement prices on seats becoming available through a huge network where everybody's sort of leveraging different things against one another, the user's always going to get the best price. The airlines are going to be forced to always operate at that lowest budget. And that's not good for them. They need to be able to sell the seats at the higher price. And it's harder for them to control that if somebody else is sort of at doing this advertising for them. Oh, that's really interesting. I never thought about it that way. I mean, the, the flight has to go, the flight doesn't have to go somewhere. The hotel has to still be there. It can't not exactly. exist for one night. <laughs> exactly. You can't, you can't take away rooms for a night, but you can take away an airplane. Right. Interesting. So summer is right around the corner. It's Memorial Day weekend here in the United States. Uh, and are there some websites that are still good for us to find deals for our summer vacations? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Google Flights is one of my favorite ones just because it's like a quick and dirty way to find what is the best time to travel if you want to get a low fare. So if you have some flexibility in your travel dates, uh, it's a good way just to sort of explore, search around and get sort of a rock bottom price um, based on when you want to travel or, or if you're flexible about where you want to go, it gives you some options there. Kayak also has really good tools for that, um, sort of exploring your options. Orbitz is wonderful. They give you now a little credit if you use them often. It's like a loyalty credit. So again, we see these aggregation sites trying to keep us with them rather than go to the hoteliers or the the airlines in general. Um, I mentioned TripIt and TripCase. Those are two wonderful apps that organize your travel itineraries for you. So when you get an email confirmation from your um, airline or your hotel or one of these third-party booking sites, it goes right into that app. That app is going to categorize for you sort of day by day your itinerary, and it's going to map it out for you in one place. It's going to strip out all that junk, all that fine print that's at the bottom of the email and just give you exactly what you want to see in a very organized timeline. What about Bing? They used to be, you know, they when they first came out with their airline search, they were lauded for how accurate and how much better it was. Are, are there, how's how is it now? They so they had um, they had a component that was purchased by another company. I don't remember what it was now, um, but it was it was like the the price predictor, I think, mm -hmm. and that that was purchased by somebody else. So it's still alive and well. It's just it part of another travel site now. It might be Kayak who bought it. Mm -hmm. um, so if you if you use Kayak, you can search for a flight for certain times and dates and say, watch this, watch this price for me. And you'll get a price prediction that says buy now or wait. If you decide to wait, it will email you or send you whatever kind of notification you want once a day, once a week, whatever you set to remind you that you were watching that flight and give you the price for that day. So if you have travel that's maybe eight weeks away, that's a really good way to say, I'm not going to buy right now, but when the price hits what I'm willing to pay, then I'm going to jump on that ticket. Yeah, there's an iOS app called Hopper that also does that. I don't know if you've used that, you've used that one before. I like yeah, that. Yeah. It's very simple. Uh, so you say you also like Hotwire, even though the website looks like it is not that great, but you, you're a fan of it. Yeah, it's one of these it's one of these companies that I think the branding is really old. I wish they would I wish they changed their name or rebrand just because it kind of has this 
stale quality to it, I think. Um, but I feel like people really shouldn't overlook hot wire. One of its one of its signature um, points is that when you book a car rental or a hotel, you can often get a really good price without seeing the name of the car rental company or the name of the hotel. But it's not the scary gamble that it sounds like. So when Hotwire promises you a car, it works with like the five or six major car companies. So you're not going to get a car from, you know, rent a rec You're going to get something from Enterprise, Hertz, Budget, yada, yada, the, the, the top five or six companies. And same thing with hotels. When you see a hotel deal and it's a great deal, great city, downtown location, they won't tell you the name of the hotel until after you book it, but they'll tell you in some fine print, Oh, it might be a hotel by, say, you know, Radisson, Omni Hotels, and the list three or four that it might be. And you can usually figure out which one it probably will be when you look at the map, the neighborhood that you're looking at, and what what hotels are actually there. So it's it sounds like it's the scary gamble that you don't know what you're going to get until after you pay, but you usually know with some certainty that you're going to get something decent. Oh, interesting. Well, Jill, thank you so much. Jill, Jill Duffy is a contributing editor to PC Magazine and has several books that you can find at uh, PC Mag, her bio there, or on Twitter at Jill E. Duffy. Thank you so much, Jill. Thanks, Megan. Take care. Coming up, Facebook Messenger wants to be your memory and passwords get a much needed upgrade. But first, we've all been there that time when you or your family finally break down and say, we're ordering pizza again don't get me wrong. I love pizza. Who doesn't love pizza? I don't trust anyone who doesn't love pizza. But there is such a thing as a crutch and mine is ordering pizza. That is where Blue Apron comes in. Blue Apron makes cooking delicious meals easy and fun by delivering fresh, ready-to-cook meals right to your door. For less than $10 per meal, Blue Apron sends you fresh ingredients, perfectly proportioned with step-by-step -step recipe instructions, including beautifully printed pictures, no trips to the grocery store, and no waste from unused ingredients. Each balanced meal is only 500 to 700 calories per serving, and it's much more interesting and better for you than pizza. Cooking takes half an hour, shipping is free, and the menus are always new they won't send the same meal twice they work around your schedule and dietary preferences and blue aprons experts source only the best ingredients for incredible meals like stewed mushrooms with creamy goat cheese polenta and fresh herb salad and chicken parmesan with fresh mozzarella and spinach zucchini pasta you will cook incredible meals and be impressed by the quality and the freshness Blue Apron, it's a better way to cook. Check out this week's menu and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's right, two free meals just for going to blueapron.com slash twit. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News tonight. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. If you use a traditional texting app on your phone, you've probably encountered that awkward moment when you get a message from someone not in your contact list and you have no idea who it is and no way to find out except by texting back, um, who are you? Facebook wants to help you with that. Also, they really want you to use Facebook Messenger and they really, really want you to spend as much time on Facebook as humanly possible. To that end, today they're rolling out a new feature that gives you information about people who contact you via Facebook Messenger. You were always able to see names and profile photos, but now you get additional information like whether or not you're already friends, where they live, their job. You'll also see basic information as long as that person has set that information to public, which is the de default for most, which most people never bother to change. Mashable reports that this new feature is rolling out to iOS and Android users in the US, UK, France, and India over the next few weeks. The Verge reports that 18 companies just received an official FIDO certification for 31 different products designed to kill the password. FIDO stands for Fast Identity Online. And as a side note, FIDO is one of my favorite acronyms of all time since our pet names are among the dumbest passwords that humans can use. In case you've never heard of FIDO, they're the folks in charge of non-password ways of identifying people like fingerprint authentic authentication and other biometric tools like eye scanners or face scanners. The official certifications announced today were the first certifications for the specification that was published in December. Those certified include Google, Samsung, Qualcomm, Yahoo Japan, and others. Sources tell The Verge that Microsoft plans to use FIDO with the next version of the specification in Windows 10. And in related news today, the Google security blog posted results to a study they did on the security questions you answer to provide an extra level of protection against hackers gaining access to your accounts. The study found that security questions are either secure or 
easy to remember, but they are rarely both, which makes them pretty much useless. I remember some con common wisdom used to be to provide the wrong answers to security questions to protect your accounts, but I never understood that because that's just one more thing to remember. And as it turns out, most people can't remember their fake answers and a lot of people can't even remember their real answers. Answers that were rememberable were easily hackable, like what's your favorite food? So what is the answer to this password conundrum? Biometrics, perhaps. But until then, Google says to use their security checkup to make sure your security settings are up to date and that you have additional ways for Google to contact you to recover your password. But what do you do with your accounts that only offer security questions? We want to hear from you. Send your password security tips to tn2 at twit.tv or directly to me at megan at twit.tv and email me your most secure passwords because I want to go to Hawaii. I'm just kidding about that last part. Don't email me your password. Yahoo Tech dug up a super secret document from the website of the Unicode Consortium. That's the governing body in charge of emoji. According to the document, several new emoji have been proposed, including the selfie emoji, the pregnant woman emoji, the face palm, the shrug, the lying face with Pinocchio nose, the drooling face, and last but not least, the bacon emoji, because what else would you be drooling over if you don't have bacon? Finally today, in cute drone news, the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne in Switzerland has created a drone that will fold up and fit in your pocket. In fact, the arms unfold by themselves and the force generated by the rotors causes the arms to move into place. We're taking a look at it right now. It's very tiny and cute but it also can be deployed quickly in large numbers to take photos or video and to locate survivors in disaster areas. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Today's TN2 selfie fan of the day is Tom Edelblut, who sent in this pic picture with the following email. I am a librarian who manages the computer systems at the Anaheim Public Library. I recently finished reading Culture Map by Aaron Meyer, where I learned that to the Japanese, the background of the picture is more important than a close-up of the face. I wonder what that picture says about me, Tom asks. Tom also has hobbies, including ham radio and photography. Thank you, Tom, for the email and for the photo. Send us your selfies. Tag your pictures with hashtag TN2Selfie on Twitter, Google+, Instagram, or via email to TN2 at twit.tv. And tell us a little bit about yourself. We'll show your selfie on the show. You can subscribe to this show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can also subscribe at Stitcher. And if you're one of the lucky Spotify users on iOS who've been upgraded to the newest features, you can watch us there on Spotify too. And if you've already subscribed and you just happen to be available at 4 p.m. Pacific time, watch our live stream every weekday at live.twit.tv. And if you're going to be in the Bay Area for Google I.O. next week, come up to Petaluma to watch this show or any of our shows in person. Just email tickets at twit.tv to reserve your spot. And we'd love to hear from you. Send your suggestions, comments, or complaint. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.